coming to you from my studio in Lutz, Florida. <clears throat> this is just a little bit of a, a preview and we're waiting for anybody just to show up. I wanted to show you things on models. So I'm gonna share the screen. The first one's called Miniature Wonderland. Play just a second of it. It's in Hamburg. Oh, it sounds off. A mammoth miniature project. It took 500,000 working hours to create this incredible miniature world on 1,300 square meters. The city's most popular. Okay, there's that one. And they've added a new section. Wonderland. And this is the new section uh, for Italy. Okay, so you can see the how, the how small it is. And then here's one that I think everybody knows the already. Fastest life, shape it's the Ardman Studios, it is not easy work. the one it's that did uh, years Wallace years and Gromit and Sean the and Sheep. And Peter has allowed and us to get our fingers. It is a, uh, all over the place and the Wear place. Rabbit and a whole bunch of those like that. So I thought you would enjoy seeing that. I found a uh, a super uh, miniature environment in Hamburg, Germany. Yeah, I've Did seen I it see before. It? Did, you've seen it? Yeah. Um, I thought you would have. I saw it uh, oh, a couple of years ago, and it was just dealing with the uh, the airport. Well, there's there's all kinds of other things, and they well they have been building. Yeah, and I don't know and they if still open, are, huh? And they still are. It's yeah, not and, pardon me. They have a new section in Italy, St. Peter's, Rome, uh, the Amalfi Coast, and just a whole bunch of stuff. Have you viewed the uh, inside uh, Ardman Animation Studio? No. Well, if that's the one that deals with the uh, Wallace and with, Gromit. With, oh, Wall yeah, I've seen that. I've seen thing on those. You, you, but you've seen the behind the scenes videos where they make up the models and all. Yeah, Gromit and and yeah, Sean know. the Sheep and the Were Rabbit and the Were Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I used to have a big poster of the where beware of the where rabbit, and the uh, uh, oh, what was the first one? Something about the pants. Oh yeah, the wrong trousers. Wrong trousers. Yeah, yeah that was Wallace and Gromit. Yeah, they're 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 online now. I think I think you can get them in in Netflix or uh, Amazon, but uh, uh, they're they're pretty cool. I thought. I thought you'd enjoy that if you hadn't seen well, it, but the I figured thing about you had that seen it. Is, you know, you have to deal in with Amazon or Disney or Netflix. Uh, yeah. yeah, Netflix. Um, and you have to have Wi Fi. No? Yeah, because oh, I've got. Oh, you mean, you mean to. Oh, but. Well, yeah, wait a minute. You, you, have, you have a. You have a computer. You can see them on your computer. Yeah, that, yeah, but you know, when you're looking at a 21-inch screen, you don't see much detail. Mm -hmm. At least you see something. Cartoon. You know, you, if it if if I had Wi-Fi, then I could put it on the on uh, get Roku and put it on the big screen. Yeah. In the other room. Yeah. 50. 50 55 inches is plenty enough, big enough screen for me, you know. Yeah. When I lost my last uh, uh, DVD player, I had to uh, get a unit to transfer the analog sound 
over to digital. And um, so now it it works great. <laughs> That's all I'll say because I'm running it through my Bose system for sound. And it's oh, an okay. old Bose system, but it works it works great. I mean, it, the Bose system is 20 some years old. And it, it, it just great sound. I can make the windows in here rattle with it when I turn mm -hmm. it up loud. Especially if you're watching a movie called Firebirds. <laughs> I use these. I have a set of bows over the ear. They're mm -hmm. not noise canceling, so I can't I can't eliminate my wife, but no. The thing that um, the uh, the model museum or whatever you want to call it in, in uh, Hamburg, uh, what gets me is the technology that they use to uh, run all those vehicles around. Oh, yeah. And um, even the airport at night, when the, uh, when the planes are coming in, supposedly, uh, they are lit up from the inside as they're, as they're coming in to land. And usually when they're towing them around, it's it, really something else to see. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, just sitting there thinking, now, how, how long did it take them to build this one plane, wire it up, uh, and the thing of it is, it makes a, when the plane takes off, it, it makes a big loop behind and comes back. Yeah, it goes in. through a curtain. Yeah, on both yeah. ends. <clears throat> Split curtain, yeah. And depending on whether it's uh, day or night, depends on whether it's lit inside. Yeah, I mean, that's against FAA rules. They're not supposed to have lights on the, when they're laying. Or women, yeah, they are, they do, they do have, and they have to have the, the window shades open. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. it's just the opposite of what I was thinking. Yeah, no, and then you know, and the and the uh, strobe lights on the plane and stuff like that are working. You know, at night, yeah. Well, yeah. They, it's, they work during the day, but you don't see them that it's much. Tremendous, tremendous detail. Oh yeah. Um, oh. Um, and the program that went into it. Do you like model trains? I am specializing in loggers. Do you know what a logger is? It's a, a machine that cuts trees or no. a system that carries logs. It's a it's a it's a train that carries logs. Um, and the thing of it is they're usually geared engines. Um, which geared means to that, carry a heavy load. Yeah, yeah, they're they're but they're they have uh, most of the time, they have external gearing on them. Um, For what two purpose? Truck and three, huh? For two what truck purpose? Three truck and three truck shays. What? A two truck or three truck shay. They have external gearing on them, and the drive shaft is on the outside uh, of the in, of the engine. It's on the outside, and it's it's actually geared. The power wheels have gears on them, and there's a shaft that has gears on it that, that drives the power wheels. And uh, there's a, a another one that's called a Climax. And uh, I forget what the third one is now. But they're all like, they, they have either external um, drivers for the wheels or uh, in some cases, uh, there's one, I forget what that is. It has a set of three compressors. I say compressors because they're pistons that are driven up and down on the outside of the engine on one side to drive the wheels. So this is not the standard 
Um, no. Drive. So this is a brushless motor on the outside of the engine truck. The 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 truck that the in a truck for the people who don't know the truck is the yeah. wheel set that set. The engine sets on and it's yeah. got a brushless motor and it drives it from the outside of the wheel. No, um, the way it's the way the models are made, the HO gauge trains. Uh, it has a gearbox in it, but the uh, gearing is external. Um, hold on a minute. So you have a gearbox on the outside of the truck. Yeah. Um, uh, can you see that? Yeah. That's from MDC Shea handbook. Yeah. And that covers a two truck and three truck Shays. What basically. is a Shea exactly? Well, if you can see here, where's my finger? It looks like a switcher engine. Well, a yard they're, engine. They're not. They're for pulling uh, logs. Okay. This is a. This is a two truck Shay here, and the one in the background is a three truck Shay. Okay. And uh, they were used for logging. And the thing of it is, when they first started, their rails, their ties and rails were wood. And they and the wheels were made to run on on the wood, originally. But uh, I've got that. I've got, I've got two Climax, two Shays, and a uh, B and O, and I forget what the other one is. But I just working on those things over there on the uh, airplanes. <clears throat> Every now and then I'll dig it, dig one out and work work on a, on the uh, engine. I, they're um, the MDC is uh, for the remote remote control for the uh, engines, and you got to do all that elec electronics work in there to uh, get them to mm -hmm. run. Right. <clears throat> so, what are, what are the capabilities of a Shea model train? They're they're geared low. So the gear is really low. They move slow, slowly. <clears throat> a lot of noise, little action. I mean, and they're all uh, they're all steam engines. All right. So it's not do like, they chuff? Do they huh? chuff? Can you hear a chuffing sound? Uh, no, but you can hear the gears run until they get worn in good. <laughs> <laughs> but. But they're, uh, as you can see, the pistons are on the outside. And and uh, the, the drive. Piston, the pistons or the gearbox? The drivers. Hold the drivers. it up a little higher. There you go. The drivers, see it right there? That little yeah. thing right yeah. there above my fingernail? Okay. Those are the, those are the drive, those are the, the pistons that drive the outside <clears throat> gearing on them. The problem with, with most of them is when you buy one of these kits, and I only buy them in kit form, um, they're not geared properly for uh, what they're supposed to represent. They're much faster than what they're supposed to represent. Well, um, I forget what the company is now. There's a company that makes a set to re-gear the trucks so that they, it, it re-gears the gearbox, but it also re-gears the trucks. I see. To drive the uh, train, to make them a lot of noise, but mm -hmm. not moving very fast. Mm -hmm. And they, they were geared to pull heavy loads. Um, they should be able to pull over the standard uh, six degree incline 
that most model railroads are, have. You don't you don't want to incline over a, a over six degrees from on the age of gauge trains. They yeah. just they just want to slide what, on the rail. What about real life? What's the maximum grade a train can pull? A, a, a well, two engine, there's a two engine diesel. I have no train. idea on a on a diesel. <laughs> yeah, that's too modern. Uh, actually, there's a there's a place towards Bryce. I think it's up near Bryce Mountain, West Virginia. Uh, Bryce Mountain, Virginia. Is it Virginia or West Virginia? Anyhow, they have uh, they run uh, geared trains uh, during the summer or during the the warmer weather, and they're they're not hauling logs anymore, but they're they're hauling tourists up up the side of a mountain and back down. Right. It's about uh, takes them about eighteen miles to go one mile up. <laughs> switch switch. Well, back. one mile up is pretty darn. That's but that's, that's a lot of back. elevation. Yeah. Well, the a. Uh, a logger is made to run through switchbacks, going up and going down. Yeah. Uh, that being when you're coming down, the engine is at, is at the tail end of what you're doing. So it's it's holding so, on uh, and going going slow to hold the train back. To, to hold the load back. Yeah. Because if it, and you're behind it because if it get if it goes bonkers you got you're not going to be dragging your train your engine back there too right right and it was for safety of the engineers and coalers yeah don't want the logs rolling oh, over no, your engine <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> i got a i got a couple of european contributions to our discussion that i I forget about these things until you say something and and then uh, it comes up. First of all, I got interested in Great Britain in the tall ships. The second thing I got interested in was the Industrial Revolution because there were some great videos on um, uh, BBC's, uh, actually they're on the they're on the internet. The program, uh, if you want to check it out, it's called um, Industrial Revelations. And the guy that presents it is, these are fairly old, but it's old material. Um, he, he was, he played Ron Weasley's father in Harry Potter. His, his name, he, yeah. he plays Father William. William, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, it's just really funny and he's really good at what he was doing, but it, it was all about, about how first, first they had grist mills and flour mills, and then, and then they, they were using water power. That was their power source, you know, and then they were going to, to charcoal and then they yeah. were going to coal. And the, and the water power, you know, you either have a grist mill or a fabric mill, you know, a yeah. cotton mill or a wool mill, something like that. Anyway, <clears throat> the canals were of two types. One was a ridge runner where it, it kept the same elevation. It didn't go up and down hills. It was all flat canal. But then, you know, they had to go up and down hills so they had locks and so judy and i got really interested in narrow boats and all that stuff <clears throat> however when when you had a canal down here and you had to go over a mountain to get to the next canal they had to take the stuff off the canal barge and put it on a, a rail car but they didn't have steam engines that were strong enough to get up the hill. <clears throat> so they put the steam engine at the top of the hill and put ropes or chains or whatever, and they hauled them up that way. That 
to me that uh, that that was just very very interesting a donkey engine pretty much yeah yeah, yeah and donkey. they use those steam engines in mines as well to yeah. pump pump out water anyway that's a whole big topic but um there was oh so when we went to great britain we went to a, a bunch of woolen mills and we went to see we took a canal ride uh on one of those narrow boats pulled by a horse and um and the we were trying to get on a, a one of the antique rail uh trains going somewhere yeah. we went on the wrong day for some reason anyway we stopped by the national rail museum in uh, yorkshire they have one hell of a big they even have well they have whole locomotives in there Mm -hmm. They have some of the very, very early uh, rails, like you said, wooden rails and and the carts that they used. They had some they had um, the Flying Scotsman, which was mm -hmm. one of the biggest, strongest, fastest uh, steam locomotives that they ever built. Now, this is this is for you and for everybody who's, you know, interested in this sort of thing. There is a fantastic um, <clears throat> British uh, show called, it's the BBC Great Continental Rail Journeys. And there's a BBC presenter who takes a night first in the first season, and there's at least seven that I've found. He takes a Bradshaw guide that was published in 1913 and he goes to different cities in Italy and Germany and Switzerland and you know places like that. And he visits cultural things, but he does it on a modern train. And sometimes uh, the last season seven, season seven, episode three was part of Germany. And he went into Berlin and, and then he went to uh, Nuremberg where I lived at one time. And then he went to Stuttgart and showed the factory. And I had forgotten this, but the, um, the designer of the Volkswagen, the Falve, the people's car, uh, was the uh, designer at, uh, uh, now I can't Dr. think. Dr. Porsche. Porsche, yeah. Yeah. Or and Porsche. However you want to pronounce it. Yeah, some, some people Porsche, some pronounce Porsche. the E on the end, Porsche, yeah. Anyway, it, it all connects. And there are some really fantastic videos. Judy and I had watched a video that was about the early designs that went into the Volkswagen and uh, how they were trying to come in. It, it wasn't just, you know, Porsche said hey i'm going to do a people's car there was a lot of crap that went on a lot of oh, people yeah. trying to design beforehand anyway well, anyway well, it's just hey, really cool you know he, he also did the uh design for a turret on the uh tiger tank oh really yeah to um a new and a new turret it's still the same 88 millimeter gun that the Tiger had, but it was a different turret, uh, more space. So he he designed the whole turret. Yeah, the turret and, that and the yeah. drive system and all. No, the drive the uh, those things those tanks were heavy, mm -hmm. and I've heard that they were powered, but most of the guys say it was just somebody in there with a crank going going crazy trying to get the turret to spin, you know gerbils yeah but um speaking of which now did you ever go to the b and o museum in baltimore mm. all right did you ever go to the mill that is just north of the national zoo there's a there's what a kind of mill the flour mill, water powered flour mill. Mm. The uh, creek. I didn't know about that. The Do you know the name of it? Down, the creek that used to go down 
past the zoo that you had to have Ford before you could go into the parking lot at the zoo at the lower end? I haven't been down there in 20 years, so I. Well, see, you just you just miss everything that was local, you know. <laughs> it's like me, Dick. I look. I was you know, gone I, at 18. Huh? I was gone at 18. Well, I wasn't. I was gone at at 20. I was going. Yeah. I was going at 20. Because let's see, I got drafted in 65 right after I turned 20. So how would I search for that flop? It's at a, is that a historic site now or is it an operational mill? Uh, I think it's a historic site. Um, run by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission or something? Yeah, either that or by the district because the zoo is in uh, still in the district. So is it going to be something like Rock Creek Park Flower Mill if I Google that? Yeah, it might. It might. Glenn, Glenn Leach's wife, Jackie, I guess that they went out driving. There's there's a um, a state park near them that has a covered bridge and um, and a, uh, a a flour mill. I can't remember when it was started. I think it was 200 years old, but it it it, it finally closed down in 1960 or 1980. But was interesting because they, they, they had such great longevity because they changed their power source. They went from water power to steam or whatever. And then they finally went to electricity. Oh, they, water power was the rotating power with uh, paddle wheel type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, then they went to turbines and then they went to electricity, which was really cool. Steam turbine, yeah, that worked. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, it, you get more efficiency. Or water of, turbine, either one, yeah. I'm sorry? Or a water tur turbine. Well, that's what it was, is a water turbine. They, they weren't blowing air through the turbine, they were- Or steam. Yeah, no, they weren't doing the steam. They were just doing the, water anyway um when i when i uh, publish this video i will put the link and maybe some pictures because the people who are in the dc area might enjoy there's a whole bunch of covered bridges in north of baltimore area it's called jericho bridge and i haven't got the slightest huh I say I haven't got the slightest. No, well, if you hadn't been up there, you wouldn't know, but I'm giving you the name. So if you want to look it up, Jericho Bridge, and then they have the, I think it's called Jerusalem Mill, and it was gun gunpowder, um, gunpowder uh, park. Gunpowder park, gunpowder yeah. creek. Huh? Now there's a gunpowder creek. Yeah, gunpowder creek. Now the the story and the reason why I think this is interesting because it's American history. The there was a a shop behind the mill. Actually, it was the Miller's house. I think they said anyway. There's a write up on it with a park and planning commission website but they actually made, stored, repaired, whatever weapons for the uh, Patriots in the uh, revolution. Hmm. So uh, next time I get up there, I'm, I'm definitely going. <clears throat> you, ever I'm, to, you ever been to Williamsburg? Oh yeah, yeah. Did you ever go to the guns, gun shop down there? No, you talk, well, I'm sure I did, but since I don't really, know the ins and outs of weapons 
I know how they work, but I, I don't know about how they're made. Lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, listen, my father was a gun collector when he was a kid. And when he left home, his brothers took all his guns, whatever. So he had one weapon left that he brought to our house in Clinton. And it was a flintlock. I think it was a Civil War flintlock. And he, he said, don't keep firing it because the firing mechanism will fall off. It was broken or tenuous or yeah. something. Um, I have I one, I, let, me, let me finish this thought. The sad part about it is we kept playing with it and kept shooting it and the flintlock did fall off. <laughs> and the barrel of that thing ended up being a, a stake in the ground with which we chained our cow out into an unfenced pasture. <laughs> so sad, so sad. The, um, the only thing I was going to say is those, um, the ones that are done down there, because they're made by basically students from William and Mary that work down in the uh, in Williamsburg. And those guns, rifles, I should say, because they're basically a Kentucky rifle. The only thing that they don't make there is the steel for the gun barrels. They buy, they buy the steel and then they do all the, uh, I want to say lancing, but tongue and groove. Uh, yeah, the rifling. The, the rifling, they right. do the rifling there, but and those rifles cost. Last time I saw one, they was they had one for it was like six thousand dollars, and they, and their uh, flintlocks. Um, you, say you say flintlocks, so, huh? Flintlocks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you were saying something about the Civil War, and by that time we had come around to percussion caps on 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 the. Uh, the rifles. Um, I think the first ones to use something like that were the, well, no, the brown best was uh, a uh, flintlock during the American uh, Revolutionary War and the War 1812. But after that, uh, there was a priest in Ireland, I think, who wanted to was an avid uh, bird hunter. And he was tired of the, his powder getting wet. So he came up with the percussion caps. Mm. And that, that's an and, interesting bit of history. And the Civil War, if you uh, check most of the, most of the Union troops and most of the Confederate troops fired uh, uh, rifles with percussion caps on them and pistols. Um, and it was a matter of getting your powder, uh, keeping your powder dry. Now, which is really strange because <clears throat> on a pistol, once you put your powder in and put your uh, ball in and, and press them in, press them down, then you smear the front of the cylinder with bear grease. Is that, so that after you, you put the, the the cotton? No, you don't use cotton wadding on a on a uh, pistol. Pistol. No. The bear the ball won't fall out. You point the pistol down, it won't fall out. No, it won't fall out because when you uh, most of these most of those shots were bigger anyhow, and when you're using a conical ball. Um, which is a sh which is a shaped ball. It's not a a true ball. Um, when it's fired, the back end of it expands and into the rifling of the barrel, which causes it to spin. Now on the uh, pistols, the forty five caliber and forty four caliber uh, Colts and Remingtons. 
do you? When you put the cylinder back in and you've got everything, you have to, that, that lever is in the front of the, that you pull down and it squeezes that ball down into the cylinder. When it squeezes it, it's going to flatten out a little bit. But the, you smear it with bare grease so that when you fire the one round, it doesn't set the rest of the rounds off. Now that's a problem that they had with the, uh, I think you may have heard of a pepper box pistol. I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a multi-cylinder pistol that you fire and you rotate and fire and rotate as you as the cylinders come about. It has, a, they had a very bad tendency of firing all rounds at once and taking a person's hand off <laughs> or fingers or whatever. Yeah. Blinding you. Um, have you ever fired an AK-47? No. I, I, was, I was looking at a, a British TV show and one of the guys that, and I can't remember his name, he's, he's a star on Top Gear, you know, the car show. Yeah. Uh, he, he, um, he was talking about the AK-47 and he said he literally was stood in front of a barn and fired it and missed the barn door. <laughs> he said it had that much force in it. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, an AK forty seven on on on. Uh, from what I hear, uh, first off, you can put the damn thing in water, pull it out, hold the barrel down, let the water drain out, and and go on and fire. Uh, the tolerances were not as such on as they were on the uh, M1, uh, M14, uh, even the uh, AR-15. Um, we had much tighter tolerances. Um, the big problem with the M16 was that uh, <coughs> that they forgot what they had learned during World War II about uh, Southeast Asia. In World War II, they, the barrels and uh, receivers on uh, M1s and, and uh, M1 carbines were chromed. Once they, once they chromed the receivers on the in, receivers and barrels on the M16, they stopped all that shit. Stop all the, the, the jamming. All the jamming. And um, was that with a jamming caused by, by dirt or rust? Smokeless or, powder. Was what? Smokeless powder. Powder build up in, in, in inside the weapon. Yeah, it's carbon deposits. Yeah. Carbon deposits. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, in 16. 16 has a really rapid rate of fire. Uh, when you, well, th and that's another thing they did. They've taken and uh, uh, stopped it, stopped it from firing fully automatic. Now it fires three rounds and stops. Pull it again, fires three rounds and stops, and that's on auto. Now the old uh, M14. <laughs> the old M14A was it A1, A2? I forget what the depth thing was on it. It would fire a full 20 rounds and just glad it had a pistol grip on it. That's all I can say. Besides, you know, a rifle stock with a pistol grip, you know. I I enjoyed learning how to fire the M. What was it? M14? M14. Yeah. The carry yeah, on I, from the M1. I got a, my, my uncle was a major in the Army Transportation Corps, but he was also a ranger. 
during World War II. And he, he said, um, he said he really enjoyed the M1. It was very, very accurate. <laughs> when I went through, uh, when I went through basic, the, you had a platoon sergeant and two assistant. Uh, let me let me rephrase that. You had sergeant. You had first sergeant major with a diamond. Are we you testing your the, memory now, or are you trying to tell me something? Field first. Anyhow, no. The 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 guy that was in charge of our section. Uh, of the first platoon, platoon sergeant, and he had two assistants with him. But this he was guy a, he would probably be an E6 and he had two E5s. He was a E7 or 8. I forget which. Three stripes up, three stripes down. Seven? That's that's Sergeant Major, but you know, while he didn't have the diamond or anything that, that the sergeant major has. Well, anyhow, he taught at the U.S. Army Special Forces School. He, oh, and he was, a, he, he was a retread they brought, called back up from uh, National Guard or whatever. And he, he was something else. And then the field first was a gentleman who had escaped from the Viet Cong. They, they put him in a foot, uh, they put him in a, a stand up locker and he kicked his way out of it. Mm. And he says, you guys are gonna die. <laughs> you guys are gonna die. You're talking about the Viet Cong? Yeah. Now he's talking about us going over there. Oh, don't get your act together. You're going to die. Yeah, yeah. But see, that's that's the difference here. Uh, I started hearing that as soon as we showed up. Uh, we got off the bus at at basic training, and that's what they were shouting. If you don't well, get your stuff together, somebody or you are going to die. The uh, I grew three or four years that day, that hour. Yeah. The thing of it is, is like, well, when I got drafted, they sent us up to Holliburg, which is no longer there. It's all been mowed down and now houses or something like that up in Baltimore. And then they sent us over to Camden Yards, where they play baseball now. Yeah. And we got on the train and headed south. Got to, uh, stopped in Washington, D.C., picked up more people, <laughs> and then uh, on to, uh, spent the night on the train, got up the next morning, we were in, uh, oh. Fayetteville, North Carolina? No. Uh, Fort? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Oh. Tank Hill, Tank Hill, and then uh, somebody somebody complained about you know. Next thing I know, if you had the money, you could go home for Christmas. Now we were drafted, inducted on the fifteenth of December, so I was home for Christmas that year, <laughs> and then back on the back on the uh, train the next night day. Heading back to Fort Jackson. You know, Bill Lloyd told me that um, he was going through Ranger School. And uh, <clears throat> a, that's it's rough. A two, it's a two week program, but they had a break in between the mountain section and the jungle section. And that was like for Christmas. And he said he got, he got pneumonia in the mountain section and but he had just enough time to recuperate over christmas before he 
had to go to the jungle. Well, you know, Nick, I got to be honest. I was, if it hadn't have been for some of the officers that I ran into, and I'm not speaking in non-coms, but I'm speaking about regular officers, I would have probably stayed in the, the service. But I ran into some real dickheads. dickheads. Yes. We called them dickheads. You said we. Um, and the, uh, you know, it's just, uh, well, let's face it. I mean, I got a little over 21 months active. I had less than, less than 90 days when I come home from Vietnam. So I got out early. What year did okay. you get out? Um, uh, 68, no, 60, 67, no, 60, let's see, 50, 20, turn 21 in service, so that would make it, uh, 66, drafted in 65, 66 and 67, I was in Vietnam, I came back in September of uh, 67. I went in April 67, got out in um, April five years later, whatever that was. Yeah. Here's 72. the thing. When I went to, uh, when I went through uh, to Vietnam, we went over on a ship. Yeah, you told me that story. Yeah, but what I didn't tell you was that Vernon Schwab also went over on that ship. Same ship? Well, it's supposed to be the same. He said the William S. Wiggle, and I figure that's the same ship. Well, he was Marine Corps. Why would he be at, unless he was serving on the ship? Uh, because, I guess they could put soldiers in. Because when we went down, when we left Oakland Army Terminal, in San, uh, it, I say San Francisco, and spent a day and a half going down the coast, to uh, San Diego, San Diego, and pulled in there. The, and the Marines got on. Now I don't know if Vernon was on the same at sick on that ship at the same time I was. Can't tell you. Yeah, because I didn't run into him. Because the Army was kind of the Marines were on the back part of the boat, and the Army was on the front part, and we were running everything <laughs> from quartermaster on. Um, but that was a hell of a ship because it made three runs that I know across the Pacific. It made a run during World War II, came back and was mothballed. Take it, they took it out of mothballs for Korea and made one trip across there and came back and was mothballed from the Korean conflict. And then we went over again on it. And it was so just it, a terrible damn ship. It, it just one trip each war? I, I can't tell you about uh, after Vietnam. I mean, when I after I got off in Vietnam, I don't know. Well, did you oh, take the same ship that, back or did you fly back? Flew back. And that's that's the hell of a thing is when you're when you're coming back and they have you in Saigon International Airport, otherwise known as Tonsonu. And you're waiting there to go home and the plane lands and all these guys get off the plane. And the first thing you notice is their nice green dress uniforms are turning from green to dark green right under the armpits and chest. Oh, oh, oh. And back. I mean, some of these guys look like they peed themselves. I mean, that's just how badly they were sweating. Because you're coming from, um, coming from air conditioning on the plane to from whatever last stop you made to 120 degree weather at night. Huh? In now, wait a minute, which way you were coming back? I was coming where, back. Where were you landing the, in the 120 degree temperatures? Not me, them coming in. 
the troops coming in. Coming into what? Saigon. Oh, 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 okay. You were in Saigon. I didn't know where you were looking at these people. Yeah, sure. You know, and I mean, then, I, uh, I bought a cool suit in London and I didn't understand what a cool suit was. It was, but it was made out of wool. I could wear it in Kentucky in the winter time, and I came to Georgia. And <laughs> it was yeah. way too hot. Yeah, I know the, what you uh, mean. The when when we left Saigon, we flew from Saigon to Tachikawa Air Force Base in Japan. And you talk about, I thought Saigon was bad, but Tachikawa was pretty bad itself. I mean, it was. It was muggy. I mean, really muggy compared to Saigon when we left. And then the next shock I got was we flew from Tachikawa to Anchorage. And we had to get off the, off the plane in Anchorage. Oh, wow. And it was snowing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, well, then I, I was, I I was thinking in. of something I wanted to share with you uh, before we go. Um, have you been to the George Washington Mill at uh, Mount Vernon? Maybe many years ago. I mean, I, you're you're talking about school, elementary school trip. Oh no! Yeah, this this probably wasn't rehabbed by when we were in school in that that age. But let me tell you, if you Google George Washington's Mill. <clears throat> they have a website that explains what they have there and they have videos with docents giving you information about how the mill works and um, it's very very interesting they're good videos but what's really cool is the economics the, and the economics went like this Washington was I guess losing money because he was growing tobacco and sending it to auction in England. He, whatever money the tobacco was sold for couldn't be sent to him. It had to be sent in the purchase of goods. So how many mm -hmm. pairs of boots can you wear? How many yeah. settees can you buy? It's ridiculous. So what he did is he wanted to set up a model program for other farmers, which is really in mind boggling in my way of thinking. So what he was doing is he was growing corn and wheat on his land and buying corn and wheat from others, milling it. He was selling the wheat to Europe as his long range, you know, uh, profit, you know, yeah. money turnaround. But for the short range, he would he would mill the corn. His uh, farm manager was Scottish, knew how to distill whiskey. Whiskey, yeah. They put in, they put in a five pot still, and they were getting. We're talking, we're talking 1790. He yeah. was getting sixty cents a gallon, I guess, for. Um, uh, for the uh, the single um, distilled well, process, well, yeah, yeah. but um, but if you did a double or a triple, it went up to over a dollar a gallon, and he sold that locally, and that was his uh, short turnaround cash money. Well, he made he made just under a hundred thousand dollars a year. I think he made somewhere in the seventy thousand to ninety thousand dollars a year in the first two or three years that he ran that mill, and mm -hmm. and he bought the first or the third patent. There was a guy in Massachusetts who figured out how to automate a mill so that one guy could run it. You know, with the the winches, and I think mm -hmm. you would really enjoy you know, learning how the grist mill uh, works, if you hadn't already. Yeah, the, 
thing of it is, it's all done with belts. Uh, some of them are, are, are uh, uh, direct pull from the uh, uh, from the water turning the wheel, but others are uh, the water turns a wheel, which turns another wheel, which turns a belt, which turns another belt, and that's you. That's usually a a um, a cotton or woolen mill. The grist mills, the grist mills are um, stone really, against stone. No, wait a minute. Well, yeah, they're stone against stone, different kind of stone. But what's interesting is that they're direct gears. There's seldom, uh, there's seldom a, a power takeoff that uses a belt. What was really interesting is they built their drive cog uh, gears with replaceable teeth because they got worn. Yeah, yeah. Just really, really cool. I just, I don't know why I'm so fascinated by it, but they're really cool. Well, you know, like most men, we, we tend to go with mechanics. <laughs> yeah. Mechanical ex aspect of it or uh, the functioning of how, how does this work, you know? What's the yeah. matter? You never turn tore a, a a clock apart to see how it works. Come on. I'm still I'm still trying to figure out the gear ratios between seconds, hours, and minutes. <laughs> I want to <laughs> I want to build my own clock with plastic gears. Well, you can do that. We're ready enough. Micromart sells a bunch of gears. You, oh yeah, yeah. I just don't know which ones just, to buy. <laughs> huh? I, I just haven't I just haven't put the time in it to yeah. I know well, there's set ratios gear ratios yeah. I have I have a a rock driven clock that has an escapement that has yeah. an armature that does this the rock rocks this thing back and forth with an escapement I'm, I never put it together but it was really cool <laughs> yeah you know the only thing I had a uh, a citizen's watch. Um, diver's watch and after 14 years 14 almost 15 years the thing finally stopped mm -hmm. without you know so now if I want to get it I got to send it off to California to have them redo it and send it back to me is it is it a wind up or is it digital it is electric yeah battery powered yeah, but from the sun. Oh, okay. And uh, now I've got a, I've got another diver's watch. It's the same way. It's powered by the sun. Well, aren't right. those aren't those cheap enough? You can just throw them away and buy a new one. Well, I'm I don't know what, you. what what do you consider cheap, Dick? Twenty five, thirty bucks. No, no, no. They're, they're about uh, $450 a piece. Is that because they're big dial? Uh, no, I don't think they're any bigger than any other watch. When I, when I got my dive license, I just use a Casio underwater watch. Yeah, well. Never had a problem with it. I've, I've killed several Casios and Timexes and whatever Elgins that are uh, electric, just yeah. by put, just by putting my hand in the water. <laughs> well, you've got to have one that's rated for at least one atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, sixty. What was it? Sixty meters? Yeah, thirty-three like feet. That. Huh? One atmosphere is thirty-three feet. Well, sixty meters. What's that? Sixty meters. Yeah. Well, that's 150, 160 feet. You yeah, know, well, you don't, you don't want to dive below 90 to 100 feet. Well, that's what the other one was rated. That's what the, uh, that's what the citizens was rated at. The citizens. Yeah, the citizens divers watch was rated at, at 60 meters. Yeah, it's sport dive watch. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. But yeah. I, you know, be, being a photographer. 
um, I needed to stay close to the surface where the light penetrated so I could take yeah. pictures of fish and the coral. I got I got a real quick one for you here. Uh, when I when I got married for the second time, we had a honeymoon cruise. It was like uh, 12 days or something like that. 12, I think it was 12, maybe even more. But on one of the islands down there, they down had where? a- Where was the cruise? Caribbean, uh, St. Uh, uh, St. Thomas. Uh, okay. St. Lucia. Uh, um, I can't think of one of the islands down there that's part French and part Dutch. Uh, St. Kitts, that's where I got my island shirt, <laughs> which I don't wear, except on special occasions. Uh, but anyhow, one of them has a, it was a indoor tank um, where you could, where the fish would just swim around in a big circle. All right. Then it had uh, sand you're on the talk, bottom. You're talking aquarium. Aquarium, yes. We, where you were in the middle of the aquarium and, and the glass all around. And there was this tarpon, big, nice sized tarpon, but it was blind in one eye and it had, it had a fish that would swim right beside it all the way around. Um, and I guess it was kind of keep it for, keep him from bumping off the wall or whatever. But what I did was I took my camera and stuck it right up against the glass, and I got some of the best pic fish pictures you ever want to oh, see. That's cool. That's with cool. With no, with no, no, no kickback from the flash or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. And trying to catch that tarpon when it come around was terrible because <laughs> you didn't know where he was going to be. And how soon he was get there, so you click it just as yeah. he come by. Photography so much easier these days. Oh yeah. Uh, well, it all depends. Now I had a, I had a Fujimi at the time, and I had two. Uh, a Fuji. Two huh. A Fuji camera. A Fuji. Fuji. I had a Fuji camera, and it had two uh, two extra lenses with it. it was. Uh, digital and the uh, thing is it went bad after a couple of years down here and I've got a I've got a, a cannon in there that cost me an arm and a leg but uh, I'm afraid to use it either because of the I don't know if it's a salt water here or what's in the air causes the shutters to go bad sand dust yeah moisture dust yeah. yeah yeah i had i had a a a, a like a two or three hundred dollar nikon you know had a fixed lens it it went bad but i've had i've had nikons and canons um just a few and i have i've had good luck but i don't i don't take them to the beach no neither do i no. I, I have a uh, come on, come up, come up, come up, come up. There you are. There is my Nikon. Cool. And you I have an interchangeable lens. No, but okay. it is a twenty-one X zoom lens. What kind of viewfinder do you have on the back? Oh. Is it okay? Okay, it's fixed. It's not swivel. No. no. Oh, I've yeah. never tried to swivel it, so I guess not. Hello. So it's and it's not a okay. Huh? It's a uh, just fairly cheap Nikon. It's a. Uh, does it have a model number on this thing? Um, I wouldn't know it. Well, it's got a. It's got a Nikon 
21X wide optical zoom VR, whatever the hell that means. That's a stabilizer, lens stabilizer. And it's uh, 4.5 by 9.94.5 millimeter. I'll show you a cool camera for not much money. This is the, the GoPro. GoPro? Yeah. And the other thing that's cool is if you buy these devices to put your, um, put your uh, cell phone on a uh, tripod or a selfie stick. I have a selfie stick that has, it's real light you know, gets the camera out there. And uh, it also has a tripod on the foot so that you could set it on a table and put it right at eye level. Oh, well, I've got the uh, monologues. I've got a box in the other room. It's got a tripod in it. It's got a sticky to stick your camera to a car window. Um, so you can take pictures from the car. It's, it's got a spike for a tree. So you can hang it on a tree or whatever. I bought those years ago. Yeah. I bought those. I, uh, when I came back from Vietnam, I had a uh, Petri 35 millimeter. And it had a, uh, and I had interchangeable lenses with that. And I, what I really liked on it was I had a uh, screw in 2X teleconverter on it. And that really helped pictures. And I used a, a basically a, a nice yellow filter that screwed onto the front. And I used that when I was shooting outdoors because it enhanced the uh, clouds. But I don't do any of that anymore. Film? Huh? Were you shooting black and white film? Color. And it, it worked on black and white too, so. Cool. And then you get in, then when you get in and you start uh, you're using black and white and you start pushing the process a little bit when, you, when you're cleaning it up, it just, you know, it, you can get areas to fade completely away and enhance other parts. And, that's just by time. And now I have a door that's open because the dog just went outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this has been an hour and fifteen minutes or so. So oh Lord. Let's well, let's call it quits. Quits. <laughs> we'll see you. See you, Dick. All right. Good chatting with you. Bye bye. Good chatting with you too. Bye. We're going. Look at it. <laughs>